When it comes to people with high IQs, we usually think of people who work in specialized fields. Artists, authors, scientists, engineers, doctors, teachers. But sometimes you'll find exceptional IQs in people who you wouldn't expect. For example, Sylvester Stallone and Dolph Lundgren are both legendary muscle-bound action movie stars who also happen to have beaten the hell out of each other in Rocky IV, but both possess a very impressive IQ of 160. Another place where you might not expect to find high IQs is among criminals, particularly in the case of this video, serial killers. A surprising number of serial killers have had what are considered to be genius level IQs. Enough for me to want to make a video ranking six of these killers based on how high their IQs are. Now, I'll be focusing solely on serial killers and not just murderers in general. Otherwise, Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb, the killers of Robert Franks, who had IQs of 210 and 169 respectively, would top this list easily. I'll also only be including serial killers whose IQs were tested and confirmed. So Rodney Alcala, aka the dating show killer, and Ian Brady, one half of the Moore's murderers, won't be on here. As though they were both believed to have IQs of at least 170, they were never tested, and as they're now both dead, they never will be. Anyway, with all of that said, here are six serial killers with the highest IQs. Theodore Robert Cowell, better known of course as Ted Bundy, is probably the most well-known serial killer in American history. Born on November 24, 1946 in Burlington, Vermont, he had a rather turbulent upbringing, with his father never being named and his mother sending him to live with his grandparents due to him being born out of wedlock. After spending the first few years of his life living with his grandmother and violent racist grandfather, he went with his mother to Tacoma, Washington, where his mother met Johnny Culpepper Bundy. The two married later that year, with Johnny formally adopting Ted and Ted taking his last name. Ted would find himself in legal trouble during his high school years, being arrested on suspicion of burglary and car theft. Bundy also claimed that he'd spend his spare time peering through windows to see if there were women undressing on the other side. He'd also forage through trash cans looking for pornographic magazines. Despite his runnings with the law and his strange habits, he was apparently well liked at school and did very well in his exams, allowing him to attend the University of Washington, where he would major in psychology and become an honor student, well regarded by all of his professors. After graduating, he got a job in Governor Daniel J. Evans's re-election, performing some espionage operations for him, whereby he'd spy on Evans' opponent, Albert Rossellini, and relay information back to him. Bundy's work led to Evans being re-elected. He was not yet 30 years old, and he'd already played a pivotal role in a major election. This showed he possessed a truly exceptional mind, and his intelligence could have helped him pursue whatever career he wanted. But of course, we all know what path he chose. Ted Bundy's first victim was Karen Sparks, a University of Washington student. In 1974, at the age of 28, Bundy broke into her apartment and viciously attacked her before f***ing her. However, she survived the attack, but was in a coma for 10 days and suffered brain damage that lasted for the rest of her life. The next month, Bundy committed his first murder when he abducted and killed another University of Washington student named Linda Ann Healy. It was here that he developed a taste for killing women and realized he wanted more. He began kidnapping and murdering college students over the course of several months in 1974. Rather than go after them, he made them come to him by posing as a man on crutches with his foot in a cast, struggling to carry a briefcase to his car. The girls, seeing this, would offer him help, to which he would accept. They would see that the passenger seat of Bundy's 1968 Volkswagen Beetle had been removed. By this time though, it was too late. Bundy would kill them with a crowbar, violate their corpses, and dump the bodies. Fear spread through the young women of Washington County, as they believed that any one of them could be next. Bundy changed his act, as witnesses had reported seeing a man wearing a leg cast and holding a briefcase with the women who had been killed. He switched to wearing a white tennis outfit with his arm in a sling and would ask women to help him unload a sailboat from his car. Due to news of a killer in the area, most of the women he approached refused to go with him to his vehicle for fear that he could potentially have been said killer. Unfortunately, two women, 23-year-old Janice Ann Ott 
and 19-year-old Denise Mary Nasland did go with him and were both murdered on the same day. Bundy was actually reported as a possible suspect by several people who knew him after they recognised the composite sketch of him and the description of his car. But the police didn't believe that Bundy, a law student with no adult criminal record, could be responsible for the murders. Bundy fled to Utah in August 1974 after being accepted for law school there. After only a month, he continued his killing spree, abducting and killing many women in the states of Utah, Idaho and Colorado even murdering the daughter of a Salt Lake City police chief. He was finally arrested in 1975, and after his car was identified as the one mentioned by witnesses, and after it was dismantled, they found hair matching that of one of his victims, he was found guilty not for murder, but for kidnapping and assault, and was sentenced to 1 to 15 years in prison. He actually managed to escape from prison in 1977, while attending a hearing after being transferred to Florida in which he served as his own attorney, climbed out of the courthouse window and fled to the woods, where he wandered aimlessly for six days before being arrested after stealing a car and being pulled over by the police. He escaped again in December of that same year, whereby he exited the prison after going through a crawl space which led to the apartment of the head jailer, who was out with his wife at the time. He then traveled through the East Coast before returning to Florida, where he attacked four college students in the Chi Omega sorority house killing two of them before fleeing the scene. His last known victim was 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, who disappeared on February 8, 1978. He was finally captured again on February 12th. A year after being returned to prison, he stood trial for the Chi Omega murders, once again choosing to defend himself, simply because he wanted to be the one in charge instead of taking advice from a lawyer. Members of the Chi Omega sorority came forward as witnesses in the trial. After seven hours, Ted Bundy was found guilty and was sentenced to death. Before pronouncing the sentence, Judge Edward Cowart let Bundy make a statement. And I'm not asking for mercy, for I find it somewhat absurd to ask for mercy for something I did not do. So I will be tortured for and will suffer for and receive the pain for that act, but I will not share the burden for the guilt. In imposing sentence, Judge Cowart cited the savagery of the crimes and what he called the indifference of the defendant. This court, independent of, but in agreement with, the advisory sentence rendered by the jury does hereby impose the death penalty upon the defendant, Theodore Robert Bundy. Then, in an unexpected move, perhaps an afterthought, Cowart stunned the courtroom with some parting words for Bundy. Take care of yourself, young man. Thank you. All right, I'll say that to you sincerely. Take care of yourself. It's a tragedy for this court to see it's such a total waste, I think, of humanity that I've experienced in this court. You're a bright young man. You made a good lawyer. I'd love to have you practice in front of me, but you went another way, partner. He received two further death sentences later in 1979 and in February 1980. He made plans to escape in 1984, but these were thwarted by the guards after they found tools he was hiding in his cell. He appealed his sentence several times over the years, but these were all denied. Realizing his days were numbered, he confessed to all the murders for which he was a suspect, as well as several others the police were unaware of. In total, he confessed to over 30 murders, though many believe he may have killed over 100 women. He was finally executed by way of the electric chair on January 29th, 1989. Bundy may be the lowest ranked serial killer on this list, but there's no denying that he was one of the most calculating and organized serial killers in history. He had great knowledge of law enforcement due to studying law in Utah, which helped him escape capture for years. He was also able to keep the police off his back by distributing his crimes over a large geographic area of several states. He'd also study his surroundings down to the most minute detail while searching for his victims and never left any fingerprints. He also kept the police off his back for the longest time due to his mild-mannered and charming personality, coming across as a perfectly nice and normal young man. If he had used his clearly exceptional intelligence to find a career as a lawyer, maybe there would have been a chance that he wouldn't have become one of America's most infamous serial killers, or perhaps he was always going to be the monster we all know him as today. As Judge Edward Coward said before sentencing Ted Bundy to death, the man was extremely wicked, shockingly evil, and vile.
I swear to fulfill to the best of my ability and judgment this covenant. I will respect the hard-won scientific gains of those physicians in whose steps I walk, and gladly share such knowledge as is mine with those who are to follow. I will apply, for the benefit of the sick, all measures that are required, avoiding those twin traps of over-treatment and therapeutic nihilism. I will remember that there is art to medicine as well as science, and that warmth, sympathy, and understanding may outweigh the surgeon's knife or the chemist's drug. I will not be ashamed to say, I know not, nor will I fail to call in my colleagues when the skills of another are needed for a patient's recovery. I will respect the privacy of my patients, for their problems are not disclosed to me that the world may know. Most especially must I tread with care in matters of life and death. If it is given to me to save a life, all thanks, but it may also be within my power to take a life. This awesome responsibility must be faced with the great humbleness and awareness of my own fertility. Above all, I must not play God. I will remember that I do not treat a fever chart, a cancerous growth, but a sick human being whose illness may affect the person's family and economic stability. My responsibility includes these related problems if I am to care adequately for the sick. I will prevent disease wherever I can, for prevention is preferable to cure. I will remember that I remain a member of society with special obligations to all my fellow human beings, those sound of mind and body, as well as the infirm. If I do not violate this oath, may I enjoy life and art, respected while I live, and remembered with affection thereafter. May I always act to preserve the finest traditions of calling, and may I long experience the joy of healing those who seek my help. What I just read was the Hippocratic Oath, a pledge of ethics named after the ancient Greek physician Hippocrates, widely regarded as the father of medicine. The oath has changed several times over the years, but to this day, all doctors recite it upon receiving their license. The oath, of course, states that the doctor will use their skills to help those in need, and under no circumstances were they ever to break it. So why would I mention this on a list about serial killers? Well, the second killer on our list is none other than Harold Shipman, aka Dr. Death. Harold Frederick Shipman was born January 14, 1946, in the Bestwood Council Estate in Nottingham, England, to Harold Shipman Sr. and Vera Britton Shipman. Raised by his working-class parents in a Methodist household, Harold excelled in school from a young age in both academics and also physical education, being an excellent rugby player. At the age of 11, he was accepted into the private High Pavement Grammar School, where he continued to excel in his education and became one of the school's star athletes, eventually becoming the vice president of the school's athletics team. He experienced tragedy at the age of 17, when his mother passed away from terminal lung cancer. Something that had a profound effect on Harold was seeing the doctors administer morphine to his mother, watching as the drug took the pain away. It was this that convinced him of the career path he wanted to take. He enrolled at Leeds University to study medicine and met and married his wife, Primrose May Oxtoby, with whom he had four children. He graduated in 1970 and commenced life as a junior doctor, but he quickly moved up the ranks and became a general practitioner at a medical center in West Yorkshire. Only a year after becoming a GP, Shipman was caught prescribing Demerol to himself. Demerol is a strong painkiller and Shipman quickly became addicted to it. He was fined 600 pounds and briefly attended a drug rehabilitation clinic in York. Unbeknownst to his colleagues, Shipman had already claimed his first victim in this time. In 1975, he killed one of his patients, 70-year-old Eva Lyons, by giving her a lethal dose of morphine, and after he was allowed to return to his duties as a doctor, he moved to Donnybrook Medical Center in Hyde, Manchester, where he continued his murderous ways. He would always target the old and vulnerable, with his oldest victim being 93-year-old Anne Cooper. He would either kill his patients right there in the medical center, or administer enough morphine to kill them slowly and send them home for their families to find dead soon after. In his 15 years at Donnybrook, it's believed that he murdered as many as 71 of his patients. In 1993, he left Donnybrook and established his own practice at 21 Market Street in Hyde. For the next five years, he continued his killing spree while fooling everyone in the local community into thinking that he was a kind-hearted and caring doctor. In 1998, however, local undertakers and other doctors began to grow suspicious of how many of Shipman's patients were dying, with the neighboring practice stating that the death rate among Shipman's patients was 10 times higher than their own. Shipman was reported to the police, 
but they made no effort to investigate, not even checking if he had a criminal record. Because of this, Shipman was free to continue killing his patients. However, this would not last for long. On June 24, 1998, Shipman killed 81-year-old Kathleen Grundy, who had served as the mayor of Hyde in the past. On her death certificate, he listed the cause of death as old age. Grundy's daughter, Angela Woodruff, was informed by her mother's lawyer that a will had been made. However, Angela immediately doubted the will's authenticity when she saw that her mother had apparently left all of her money, over £380,000, to Shipman. Grundy's lawyer suggested Angela go to the police. They exhumed Grundy's body and found diamorphine in her muscle tissue. Shipman told the police that she was a morphine addict and even showed his computer medical journal where he mentioned this. However, the police found that these comments had been added after her death. He was arrested on September 7, 1998, and the police found the typewriter that he had used to forge the will that Grundy's daughter was given. Over the next two months, the bodies of another 11 victims were exhumed. A police expert also checked Shipman's surgery computer and discovered that he had made false entries to support the fake causes of death he gave on the victim's death certificates. Police managed to verify 14 other cases where Shipman had given lethal doses of diamorphine, falsely registered the patient's deaths, and tampered with their medical history to show that they were dying anyway. Shipman always denied the murders and refused to cooperate with the police or criminal psychiatrists. When the police tried to question him or show him photos of his victims, he sat with his eyes shut, yawned, and refused to look at any of the evidence. Police could only charge Shipman with 15 murders, but it's been estimated that his kill count is anywhere between 250 and 450. He was sentenced to life in prison on January 31st, 2000. He spent just under four years behind bars before he was found dead in his cell on January 13th, 2004, after he hanged himself from the bars of his window using his bed sheets. This occurred on the day before his 58th birthday. It's believed he took his own life to ensure his wife would receive his pension, as she would have received nothing had he lived past 60 years old. A number of theories have been put forward to explain why Shipman had the urge to murder. Some say that he may have been avenging the death of his mother. Others believe he truly thought he was showing compassion to the elderly by killing them painlessly with diamorphine. Though the fact that his murder of Kathleen Grundy was clearly motivated by profit shows that this was unlikely to be the case. Others believed he simply had a god complex and thought that as a doctor, he should be able to decide whether someone lives or dies. Whatever the case, Harold Shipman, once a child prodigy who looked to have a long and fruitful career in the field of medicine, broke the oath he took when he first became a doctor, and instead of being respected and remembered with affection, is now seen as nothing but a heartless monster who preyed on the most helpless members of society while fooling everyone into believing that he was a good doctor. It just goes to show that even those who we feel we can trust with our well-being are capable of performing acts of evil. To those who knew Edmund Kemper, he seemed like the furthest you can get from a serial killer. Despite being six foot nine and possessing remarkable strength, he came across as what can best be described as a gentle giant, who was also very smart. They had no idea, however, that the towering, mild-mannered young man would one day be arrested for the murder of eight women, going down in infamy as the co-ed killer. Edmund Kemper was born on December 18th, 1948 to Edmund Emil Kemper and Clarnell Elizabeth Kemper. Edmund's father was a World War II veteran who became an electrician after the war, while Clarnell was a housewife. She was also an alcoholic who possibly had borderline personality disorder, as she regularly displayed erratic and sometimes violent behavior. This put a strain on her and Edmund Sr.'s marriage, with him saying, suicide missions in wartime and the later atomic bomb testings were nothing compared to living with Clarnell. She would regularly berate and demean her husband for being an electrician, as she considered this to be a, quote, menial job. She also had a very strained relationship with her son Edmund. She rarely showed any love or open care for him, as she believed doing so would, quote, turn him gay. The neglect he received from his parents led to the antisocial behavior that would be the first signs of what Edmund would become. As early as the age of 10, he began being cruel to animals, going as far as to bury a cat alive and mutilate it after it died, getting pleasure from committing the heinous act. 
He also killed the family cat when he was 13 years old, as he believed it favoured his sister over him. He even kept the cat's remains in the closet before his mother found them. In addition, Edmund forced his sisters to play disturbing games, like electric chair and gas chamber. He once even stalked his second grade teacher while carrying his father's bayonet. By his early teens, Edmund's father had left the family, and his mother now directed all of her aggression towards him. She made him sleep in the basement, claiming that he might hurt his sisters, and she regularly insulted him, telling him that no woman would ever fall in love with him. When he was 14, Edmund ran away from home to live with his father, but he had remarried by that point, and instead sent Edmund to live with his grandparents. It was here that Edmund first became a killer. Edmund hated his grandmother, Maud Kemper. He claims that she, quote, thought she had more balls than any man and was constantly emasculating him and his grandfather to prove it. While it would seem he didn't hate his grandfather, it's clear that they weren't particularly close, as all he had to say about him was that he was senile. Edmund would regularly argue with his grandmother, saying that she pushed and pushed him to the point that he, in his own words, became a time bomb, and it was only a matter of time before he blew. On August 27th, 1964, Edmund got into yet another explosive argument with his grandmother, but this time, he shot Maud in the head with his grandfather's 22 calibre rifle. Then, as his grandfather walked up the driveway toward the house, Edmund shot him too. He said he killed his grandmother just because he wanted to know how it would feel to murder her. He killed his grandfather to spare him from the shock of seeing his wife dead. After they were both dead, he called his mother and confessed to everything. Edmund would be sent to the criminally insane unit of the Atacerado State Hospital. It was here that doctors diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia, and also where they discovered that Edmund possessed an impressive IQ of 145. He stayed in the facility for five years before being released on his 21st birthday and returning to live with his mother. He attempted to get a job as a state trooper, but at six foot nine and 300 pounds, he was told he was simply too large and instead got a job in the Department of Transportation. That said, he was friendly with much of the local police force and would usually hang out with them at their favorite bar, the jury room. While driving around California as part of his job, he noticed a lot of young women hitchhiking and even gave around 100 of them lifts without incident. But whenever he had a woman in his car, he felt two kinds of urges, those of a sexual nature and those of a homicidal nature. On May 7th, he picked up two Fresno State students, 18-year-old Marianne Pecci and 18-year-old Anita Lucesha near Berkeley, California. Edmund brought the two women to a wooded area nearby, intending to violate them, but he panicked and instead stabbed and choked the women to death. He then put the bodies in his car, took them home, and dismembered them before dumping them in a ravine near Loma Prieta Mountain. His next victim was 15-year-old Aiko Ku, who he picked up after she missed her bus to dance class. He choked her unconscious before killing her and once again dumping the body in the same ravine. His third victim was 18-year-old Cindy Ann Shaw, who he killed with a 22 caliber pistol. After dismembering her body, he buried her head in his mother's garden, facing her bedroom, because she always wanted someone to, quote, look up to her. His next two victims were Rosalind Thorpe and Alison Liu. By the time he killed them, the local police had been realized there was a killer targeting students, warned young women in the area to only accept lifts from drivers with university stickers on their car. He was able to acquire one of these stickers due to his mother working at the University of Santa Cruz. He shot both Thorpe and Lou before disposing of the bodies in the ravine. Throughout Edmund's murder spree, the only person he truly wanted dead was his mother. After he began living with her again, the two would engage in constant arguments, bringing Edmund right back to his childhood, until one day, he finally snapped. On April 20th, 1973, Edmund bludgeoned his mother to death with a claw hammer while she was sleeping. He then decapitated her and used her severed head as a dartboard. He also screamed at the head for an hour straight. He then invited his mother's best friend, Sally Hallett, over to the house. He murdered her and stole her car, and planned to tell the police that she and his mother had gone on vacation together. He then drove to Colorado, certain that he would soon see the two murders in the news. But after not hearing anything for a while, Edmund ended up calling the police from a phone booth, and he confessed to everything. At first, the police didn't believe that Big Ed, as they knew him, could be responsible for committing such horrifying and depraved murders, but as soon as he began describing what he had done to his victims, 
there was no denying that he was indeed the co-ed killer. When asked why he stopped killing and turned himself in, Edmund said it wasn't serving any physical or real emotional purpose, it was just a pure waste of time. Emotionally, I couldn't handle it much longer. Edmund was arrested and later convicted of eight counts of first degree murder. He attempted suicide twice and even requested the death penalty, but was ultimately given seven life sentences instead. He was imprisoned at the California Medical Facility and still resides there now at the age of 72. In his time behind bars, Edmund has garnered a reputation as a model inmate, to the point where he is now in charge of scheduling other inmates appointments with psychiatrists and most interestingly, has recorded over 5,000 hours worth of audiobooks for various stories. Sometimes uh, children's books, some of the more complex children's books like uh, White's, Charlotte's Web, uh, Stuart Little, Trumpet of the Swan, um, which were amazingly complex and before their time. Reaching for the internal controls, 3PO was shocked. Behave yourself, R2! He finally chastised his companion. You're going to get us into trouble! Truly, when I was very young, way back in the 50s, I believed all of life would be like one long and perfect summer day. After all, it did start out that way. There's not much I can say about our earliest childhood except that it was very good, and for that, I should be everlastingly grateful. We weren't rich, we weren't poor. If we lacked some necessity, I couldn't name it. If we had luxuries, I couldn't name those either, without comparing what we had to what others had and nobody had more or less in our middle-class neighborhood. In other words, short and simple, we were just ordinary run-of-the-mill children. Despite his insistence that he's a changed man, and deeply regrets what he did all those years ago, he's been denied parole nine times, with the prison's reasoning being, quote, we don't care how much of a model prisoner he is because of the enormity of his crimes. Edmund's half-brother, whose name is unknown to protect his identity, does not believe that he has changed at all, and believes that Edmund is nothing more than, quote, a complete sociopath. He could look you straight in the eye, telling you how sorry he is for everything he did, while at the same time, plotting your demise, and you never even have a clue. Andrew Kunanen was born on August 31st, 1969, the youngest of four children to Modesto Kunanen, and Mary Ann Shilachi. Growing up, his parents would tell him that he was special and destined for greatness. His father enrolled him at the Bishop's School, a private school in San Diego, California, for gifted and exceptional children. It was here that 12-year-old Andrew's IQ was discovered to be a very impressive 147, which, much like Harold Shipman and Edmund Kemper, put him at genius level. As he grew older, his parents spoiled their gifted son more and more, buying him a sports car, giving him the master bedroom of the house, and even his own bathroom. His home life was still unhappy, however, due to the breakdown of his parents' marriage brought about by the chronic depression his mother suffered due to the verbal abuse inflicted on her by his father. To help himself cope with the trauma, Andrew would lie to his peers and tell them of how perfect his life was and how wealthy his family were. In 1988, when Andrew was 19 years old, his father, who was a stockbroker, left the family and fled the United States to the Philippines after he was suspected of embezzling $100,000. He took almost all of the family's money and sold the house while they were still living in it. At this time, Andrew was enrolled at the University of California, where he majored in history. After his father left, though, he spent less time studying and instead frequented gay clubs in the area where he'd often have liaisons with wealthy older men, obviously with the intention of getting money from them. His mother, who was a devout Catholic, upon learning of his sexuality, voiced her disapproval of what her son was doing. During an argument with his mother, Andrew became violent and threw her against a wall, dislocating her shoulder, for which he showed no remorse or empathy. In 1989, Andrew dropped out of college and moved to the Castro district of San Francisco, a popular area in the city's gay community, and moved in with his old high school friend, Liz Cole, and her boyfriend, Phil Merrill. He continued dating wealthy older gay men in the area and gained a reputation among them. He was also known to idolize fashion designer Gianni Versace, as he was what Andrew wanted to be, rich and famous. He also claimed to have met Versace, but this has never been verified. For the next several years, 
Andrew continued having relationships with a number of different men, never having a job as they paid for everything for him. Unfortunately for him, his lies would soon catch up with him. In 1996, Andrew was in a relationship with a man named Norman Blatchford. Blatchford supported Andrew by buying him a car and gave him access to his credit cards so he could buy whatever he wanted. However, Blatchford ended their relationship when he tracked Andrew's spending habits and discovered that he was not Andrew De Silva, the son of a pineapple plantation owner he claimed to be. With this breakup, Andrew was no longer living the luxurious lifestyle he craved so much. Around this time, he had already broken up with David Madsen, an architect living in Minneapolis, as Madsen believed that there was, quote, something shady about Andrew. Andrew's friend, Jeffrey Trail, also broke off his friendship because he was tired of Andrew's lying and erratic behavior. At one point, Andrew asked Trail to join him to sell drugs, but Trail refused. The abandonment issues he suffered as a result of everyone close to him cutting him out of their lives began to be too much for him to bear, and by April 1997, he began abusing painkillers and alcohol. Later that month, he told the few friends he had left that he was going to Minneapolis to, quote, settle some business with Jeffrey Trail. He arrived in Minneapolis on April 25th, and David Madsen allowed him to stay at his apartment. The next day, he met Trail and stayed in his apartment while the latter went out with his boyfriend. Andrew and Trail had an intense argument, and after once again returning from going out with his boyfriend, Trail found that Andrew was gone. He soon received a call from him, informing him that the latter had stolen his gun, and told him to come to David Madsen's apartment to retrieve it. Both Andrew and Madsen were in the apartment upon Trail's arrival. As soon as Trail walked through the door, Andrew beat him to death with a hammer, right in front of Madsen. Following this, Andrew held Madsen hostage, forcing him to act as if there was nothing wrong, and even going out with him for walks. On May 2nd, the two were seen driving in Madsen's Jeep and eating in a bar. The next morning, Madsen was found dead on the shore of Rush Lake. Andrew had shot him dead with the gun he stole from Trail. On May 4th, after fleeing Minneapolis, Andrew made his way to Chicago. He broke into the home of real estate developer Lee Milligan, tied him up, beat him, and stabbed him 20 times with a screwdriver before stealing his car. It's unknown if this was a random attack or if Milligan was another one of Andrew's sugar daddies that he had decided to murder. Milligan's car had a phone in it that the police began monitoring in order to find his murderer. On May 9th, they found the phone had been activated in Finns Point National Cemetery in New Jersey. It was here that Andrew had shot the cemetery's caretaker, William Reese, before stealing his car. Knowing now that Andrew was behind all of these murders, the FBI placed him on their top 10 most wanted fugitives list and a nationwide manhunt began. Despite this, Andrew evaded the police for over two months and either didn't care if he was caught or was simply confident that they'd never find him, as he actually used his real name when selling a stolen item at a pawn shop. By July 14th, Andrew had run out of money and checked out to the hotel he was staying at in Miami, Florida. The next day, he would commit his final murder. On July 15th, 1997, at around 8.35 a.m., Andrew made his way to the Versace mansion in 1116 Ocean Drive, Miami. It was here that he saw Gianni Versace. Versace had gone out for a walk to collect some magazines, something he'd usually have his assistant do for him. Gianni Versace was a man who Andrew had previously idolized and due to his delusions of grandeur, had told others he was friends with. As Versace was walking up the stairs to his home, Andrew shot him point blank with the gun he had stolen from Jeffrey Trail, killing him. He then fled the scene. The police found his stolen car nearby, which contained his clothes and newspaper clippings about the previous four murders. Andrew spent the next eight days hiding in a luxury houseboat. On July 23rd, a caretaker in the area called the police after hearing a gunshot coming from the boat. The police then searched the boat and found Andrew, dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. There's never been a definitive motive for Andrew's murder spree. His murders of Jeffrey Trail and David Madsen appear to have been motivated by jealousy. He resented them both for having successful careers, while he never held down a steady job and mostly leached off older men. He also hated that their families accepted their homosexuality, while his family shunned him for being gay. Andrew was also jealous of Gianni Versace, who was seen as an icon for the gay community. Versace was a rich and successful gay celebrity, which is what Andrew wanted to be, but could not. Due to the rejection and jealousy of those individuals, 
it's possible that this is why Andrew killed them. However, some people believe that Andrew killed Versace in order to gain fame and notoriety by killing a celebrity. As for Lee Milligan and William Reese, it's likely that his only reason for killing them was to acquire their cars. Andrew Cunanan wanted a life he could never have, the life of being rich and famous. When his life began crumbling down due to his father abandoning him, his friends cutting them out of their lives, and his rich sugar daddies leaving him, he realized that the only way he would be famous would be by taking the lives of innocent men and reveling in the attention his crimes were getting, before killing the world-famous Gianni Versace. Andrew is the only killer on this list who was never caught, and also had the second fewest victims, but much like Ted Bundy and Harold Shipman, he threw away any possibility he had of a promising future by letting his pride, greed and jealousy get the better of him, ultimately becoming a cold-blooded killer. The final two killers on our list are, to my knowledge, the smartest serial killers in history who have had their IQs confirmed. To put this into perspective, Stephen Hawking and Albert Einstein were both believed to have IQs of 160. The next killer on this list equals that number, while the final one of course has an even higher IQ. In other words, we're entering evil genius territory now. Unlike everyone else on this list, Charlene Gallego did not work alone and committed all of her murders alongside her husband, Gerald Gallego. While Gerald's IQ is unknown, Charlene possessed a truly remarkable IQ of 160, which, as I said, is equal to that of Stephen Hawking and Albert Einstein. Why would someone with such a presumably brilliant mind want to go on such a violent and gruesome killing spree with her own husband? Charlene Gallego was born Charlene Adele Williams on October 10, 1956 in Sacramento, California to Charles and Mercedes Williams. Charles was a successful entrepreneur and the vice president of a supermarket chain, with Mercedes working as his assistant. Charlene had a good home life as a child. Thanks to her father's job, the family always had plenty of money and her parents would often spoil her with everything a young girl could want. This didn't turn Charlene into a spoiled brat, however, as she was apparently quite shy and quiet at school, but was very rarely absent and got good grades. Charlene's mother was hurt in a car accident at some point while she was still in school. Due to this, her mother could no longer travel with her father, so Charlene actually took her mother's place and helped her father with his work, and would often travel with him on business trips. She was often praised by her father's clients for being an intelligent and well-spoken child. Upon entering high school, she continued to excel in academics and was also regarded as an excellent violinist and played in the school orchestra. At some point, however, Charlene began taking drugs and also started sleeping around, with one of her boyfriends being black, much to her friend's disapproval. After high school, Charlene married a wealthy young man who was also a heroin addict. He claimed that Charlene was obsessed with lesbian sex and begged him to have a threesome with her and a prostitute. She was also using a large number of drugs and didn't care about her appearance. Charlene's parents intervened in her marriage, which led to it collapsing and the couple divorcing. She later married again, this time to a soldier. However, Charlene divorced him very quickly, as she described him as, quote, a mommy's boy, and lost patience with him. Following this, she had an affair with a married man, but he ended it after Charlene tried to get him to invite his wife to a threesome. Charlene attempted suicide following this breakup, but survived. It was not long after that she met Gerald Gallego. Gerald's upbringing couldn't have been more different from Charlene's. His mother and her numerous boyfriends had beaten him during his childhood, and when his mother became a prostitute, he was abused by some of her clients. He was often left hungry and dirty, and was always pleading to be held and hugged. His biological father, who had played no part in his life, was executed for killing two policemen. He began his own criminal career when he was only 13 years old, where he assaulted a six-year-old girl. Prior to meeting Charlene, he had been arrested 23 times and also served prison time for robbery. He and Charlene met not long after her suicide attempt. Charlene and Gerald fell in love instantly upon meeting each other and began living together within a week by renting a house together. Charlene knew and accepted that Gerald was only interested in his own sexual satisfaction and not hers. 
he brought a 16-year-old dancer home one day for them to have a threesome, but Charlene and the dancer were not allowed to touch each other. Gerald was angry to find Charlene and the dancer intimate in bed the next day when he came home. He tossed the dancer out of the window, beat Charlene, and withheld sex from her for one month. Gerald could not become sexually excited anymore, and it was mentioned that Charlene or someone else suggested for them to kidnap females to become sex slaves. Over the next two years, the two of them would embark on a killing spree that would leave 10 people dead. Their first two victims were 17 year old Rhonda Scheffler and 16 year old Kippy Vaught. Charlene lured them into her and Gerald's van while the girls were shopping at the Country Club Plaza in Sacramento County on September 10th, 1978. The Gallegos then proceeded to bite them repeatedly before driving them back to Sacramento County the next day and bludgeoning them both with a tire iron before shooting them dead. On June 24th, 1979, the two kidnapped their next two victims, 14-year-old Brenda Judd and 13-year-old Sandra Colley, who the Gallegos met at a fair in Washoe County, Nevada. The couple told the girls that they could make some money by delivering leaflets and asked them to come with them in their van to get the flyers. Charlene drove on the I-80 heading out of Reno while watching Gerald in her rearview mirror, attacking the girls repeatedly. Charlene parked the van in Humboldt Sink, an isolated area where Gerald pulled Sandra out of the van while holding a shovel. He took her to a dry creek bed and hit her from behind with the shovel. Gerald then beat Brenda to death, dug a hole, buried their bodies in it, and put a rock over the grave. On April 24, 1980, Charlene and Gerald kidnapped Stacy Redican and Karen Shipman Twiggs, who were both 17 years old, from the Sunrise Mall in Citrus Heights, California, and violated them before killing them. On June 6, 1980, they kidnapped 21-year-old hitchhiker Linda Teresa Aguila, who was four months pregnant. She was beaten with a rock and buried alive in a shallow grave. The Gallegos then left her to die. On July 17, 1980, the two kidnapped 31-year-old Virginia Mochel from a West Sacramento tavern where she worked as a barmaid. Virginia's body was found several months later tied up at nylon fishing line outside Clarksburg, California. On November 2nd, 1980, Gerald approached 22-year-old Craig Miller and his fiancée, 21-year-old Mary Elizabeth Sowers, in the Arden Fair Mall parking lot in the early morning. He pointed his 25 caliber Beretta and demanded the couple to enter the car. But friends saw what was happening and wrote down the license plate number. Gerald drove the couple to an isolated area. He then ordered Craig to get out of the vehicle and shot him three times, with Mary witnessing everything. Gerald ordered Charlene to drive them to their apartment, where he later violated Mary repeatedly for several hours. He then commanded Charlene to drive them along with Mary to a rural area, where he shot Mary three times. Friends who witnessed Craig and Mary's kidnapping informed the police and gave them the license plate of the Gallegos van. The police used this information to track down and arrest them at a Western Union office, where they were in the process of receiving money from Charlene's parents. Gerald and Charlene pleaded not guilty to charges of kidnapping and murder. Charlene's attorneys were eventually able to convince prosecutors in several states and counties to allow Charlene to testify against Gerald for a plea deal that reduced her prison sentence to 16 years and 8 months. Charlene was released from prison in 1997 while Gerald was sentenced to death but died from cancer in 2002. After being released, Charlene returned to Sacramento and changed her name to Mary Martinez and even remarried. Years after being released, Charlene was interviewed and stated that she never wanted to take part in the killings and that Gerald forced her to do it, even going as far as to claim that she tried to help the people that they kidnapped. She also claimed that she was glad to have helped send Gerald to death row and she'd do it again given the chance. She's also operated two charities for combat veterans after losing a family member in battle. However, Mary Elizabeth Sauer's father, Hal, believes that Charlene doesn't regret what she did at all and that she's just as guilty as Gerald. Whatever the case, Charlene managed to escape the death penalty and has lived freely for over 20 years, using her family's lawyers to help put almost all of the responsibilities solely on Gerald. For as intelligent as Charlene is though, she seemingly hasn't been able to fool anyone into thinking that she's truly changed her ways, and she'll always be remembered as one half of the serial killer couple who took the lives of 10 innocent people.
The final killer on our list is, to my knowledge, the one with the highest IQ ever found in a serial killer. A former Harvard-educated mathematics professor, regarded as a genius by all of his peers, who threw it all away to live as a hermit in the wilderness, and later turned into a domestic terrorist, who plagued America over the course of 17 years, becoming known as the Unabomber. Theodore John Kaczynski was born in Chicago on May 22, 1942, to Polish immigrants Wanda and Theodore Kaczynski Sr. Ted grew up in a suburban middle-class household, raised alongside his brother David, who is said to have idolized his big brother as they were growing up. Ted was quiet, sensitive, and shy with other people, but loved animals and being outdoors. He also had an IQ of 167, placing him just above Stephen Hawking and Albert Einstein. When Ted was 15, he graduated early from high school and with his parents' encouragement, applied to and was accepted at Harvard. He started his freshman year at 16. During his first year, Ted was quarantined in a special housing set aside for the youngest and least mature freshmen. This caused Ted to become even more introverted, with him making few friends and spending most of his time in his room or the library when not in class. In the fall of his sophomore year, his mother received a permission slip in the mail stating that Ted had been accepted into a psychological study for gifted young men, overseen by his professor, Dr. Henry Murray. Ted would go to Murray's lab and after writing essays about his deepest beliefs, values and ideals, would debate another student while his vital signs were monitored. Hooked up to electrodes and facing a one-way mirror with bright lights pointed at his face, Ted would debate a law student who was instructed to berate, mock and belittle everything he held dear. Ted described it as, quote, the worst experience of my life. But he stayed in the study for three years, as he later explained, quote, I wanted to prove I could take it, that I couldn't be broken. After graduating from Harvard, Ted attended the University of Michigan to pursue a master's and then a PhD in mathematics. But it was here that he began to lose his mind. He hated his fellow students and his teachers. In his bedroom, he thought he could hear his neighbors whispering about him. Once, in a manic fit of sexual frustration, he decided the only way he could touch a woman was to become one. He made an appointment with the campus health center to discuss a possible gender reassignment surgery, but in the waiting room, he had a change of heart. Embarrassed and angry with himself, his rage shifted to the thought of killing the psychiatrist he was waiting to see. Eventually, he decided, quote, I will kill but I will make at least some effort to avoid detection so that I can kill again. After completing his doctoral studies, 25-year-old Ted became the youngest ever mathematics professor at the University of California, but the assessments for most of the students were less than stellar. He did not explain things well. He was too impatient with slow learners, and at the end of his second year teaching in 1969, he abruptly quit his job. After this, Ted made the decision to move to the wilderness to get away from the society that he wanted no part of. His brother David chose to accompany him on his journey, with the two of them settling in the woods of Montana, where they built a small 10 foot by 12 foot cabin. David had planned on building a cabin of his own next to Ted's, but he quickly realized that he didn't want to live in the wilderness in such primitive conditions, and left to get a teaching job in Iowa in 1973. For a few years, Ted truly seemed to hope that solitude would soothe his troubled mind. He dedicated himself to reading, learning survival skills, hunting, identifying edible plants, and even experimenting with crossbreeding new types of carrots. But by the end of the decade, society had begun to creep into Ted's life once again, as more houses were built around his cabin, and ATVs, motorcycles, snowmobiles, and other recreational vehicles became more common. Planes and helicopters, which Ted had a particularly strong hatred for, also became more common. Contrary to popular belief, Ted didn't spend over 20 uninterrupted years in the wilderness. In 1978, he moved back to Chicago to get a job in the same factory as his brother. While there, he had a relationship with a female supervisor, but the relationship eventually fell apart. In retaliation, Ted wrote crude limericks about her, resulting in his dismissal from the company, and it was his own brother, David, who had to break the news to him. Before he returned to Montana, Ted would begin his reign of terror that would last for the next 17 years. He constructed a bomb from smokeless powder, match heads, nails, potassium nitrate, razor blades, and various other caustic substances. He packaged the bomb and left it at the University of Chicago with a return address for a Northwestern University professor. 
The package was forwarded to Northwestern and opened by a campus security officer, who thankfully survived with only minor injuries after being caught in the blast. Another bomb was sent to the same university the following year, in which a student opened the package, but again received only minor injuries, but this would pale in comparison to his next attack. On November 15, 1979, Ted managed to smuggle one of his bombs into the cargo of the American Airlines flight 444 Boeing 727. The bomb detonated in the hold, but did not go off properly, and filled the plane with smoke, causing the pilot to make an emergency landing. Twelve people were treated for non-lethal smoke inhalation. It's theorized that, had the bomb detonated properly, it most likely would have destroyed the entire plane. Ted then returned to his cabin in Montana, and from this point on, would carry out his attacks via mailing his bombs to his targets. He attacked the University of California twice, the same university where he'd once worked as a teacher. In 1987, one of his bombs was opened by engineering professor Diogenes Angelakos, who received severe burns and shrapnel wounds to his face. Three years later, another bomb was sent to the university and was opened by John Hauser, a graduate student, who lost four fingers and most of the vision in his left eye in the blast. Throughout the rest of 1985, Ted would send several bombs, one to the Boeing Company in Auburn, Washington, which was defused, and two to the University of Michigan, which resulted in those caught in the blast suffering hearing loss and severe burns. In December of that year, Ted would claim his first victim when he sent a bomb to computer shop owner Hugh Scrutton in Sacramento, who was killed in the blast. In 1983, he sent two more bombs, one to geneticist Charles Epstein in Tiburon, California, and another to Yale University, which was opened by computer science professor David Galanta. Epstein suffered damage to his eardrums and lost three fingers, and Galanta lost his right hand. Ted's final two bombs would both claim the lives of their recipients. Thomas J. Mosser, an advertising executive from North Cadwell, New Jersey, who was killed on December 10, 1994, and Gilbert Brent Murray, a timber industry lobbyist from Sacramento, California, who was killed on April 24, 1995. After this, Ted told mainstream media outlets that he would end his attacks if his 35,000 word manifesto, Industrial Society and Its Future, was published. The FBI told these outlets to publish the manifesto in hopes it could help identify the Unabomber. Around this time, a private investigator working for Ted's brother David had contacted the FBI and asked them to compare the manifesto to letters written to David by his brother. It was in these letters that they found similar typing idiosyncrasies to those found in the manifesto, leading them to the conclusion that Ted was indeed the Unabomber. He was arrested on April 3rd, 1996. In his cabin, the FBI found bomb-making materials, 40,000 handwritten journal pages that included bomb-making experiments, descriptions of the Unabomber crimes, and one live bomb, ready for mailing. They also found what appeared to be the original typed manuscript of Industrial Society and its future. At the time of his arrest, the investigation into the Unabomber was the most expensive ever performed by the FBI, totaling $50 million, which would be $87 million today. It was initially believed that Ted would face the death penalty for his crimes, but he was sentenced to life in prison without parole after pleading guilty to all charges. He's currently incarcerated at the ADX Florence Supermax Prison in Florence, Colorado. While he had the fewest victims out of everyone on this list, he clearly intended to kill everyone who received one of his bombs. Several people suffered horrific and disfiguring injuries because of him, and had his bombing of the Boeing 727 gone to plan, his kill count would have been over 100. In the years since his arrest, he's developed a large following online of people who share his anti-technological views, and these people clearly don't realize that they're using either a computer or their phone to take part in these communities, thereby completely going against Ted's warped ideals. Ted Kaczynski, in my opinion, isn't someone who should be idolized or admired. He's essentially a real-life evil genius, a man who could have used his remarkable intelligence to teach the future generations, and instead became a mad bomber who didn't care if people suffered and died at his hands, as long as he could get his point across. And that's the end of the video, folks. I'm really sorry this one took so long. I ended up procrastinating quite a lot during the scripting process, which made this video take a couple of weeks longer than I had planned. I do really want to have a video out for Halloween, so I'm going to try my hardest to make that happen. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Please like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe if you're new. And I'll see you all next time.
Goodbye.